This episode is dedicated to my teacher and master, Sheikh Dr. Abdul Qadir Asufi. Rahimullah. May Allah give him expansion in his tomb and fill it with his nur and barakah. I also dedicate this episode to the fukara of Sheikh Abdul Qadir. For the pleasure of life is only in the company of the fukara. They are the sultans, the masters, the princes. The New Nomos podcast is a call. A call for a new beginning. A call for the new men and the new women that yearn to be truly free. A call for us to fulfill our destiny. A call for a new nomos on the earth. Welcome to the New Nomos Podcast. I'm Abdallah Dutton, inviting you to join me on this journey of discovery to define what the new nomos is and what we need to get there. This chapter marks one year since I released my first episode. It's been an absolutely amazing journey. I've learned so much. And through embarking on this project, so many doors have opened for me. So at this point, I want to send out my heartfelt gratitude for everyone that's been tuning in, everyone that's supported me on this journey, everyone that's been sharing the episodes and broadening the reach of this podcast, and for all the feedback and motivation that I've been receiving over this year. But there is one person that I have to name and thank in particular, and that is my wife, Sahra, without whom this podcast would just not be possible. So once again, thank you. The message in this episode is one that comes directly from my heart. Almost exactly six years ago, in April 2016, I received a call from Sheikh Abdul Qadir late at night, asking me to come to his bedroom with my laptop. So I made myself presentable, picked up my laptop and charger, and went through to the Sheikh's room where I was asked to transcribe an article for Sheikh Abdul Qadir's website. This article was to be titled, Hail to the Crown Prince. And in it, Sheikh Abdul Qadir explained the significance of the changes that were happening in Saudi Arabia at that time. I can remember this event with crystal clarity. I can remember every word the Sheikh was dictating to me, and typing each word onto my computer. And on that night, a love for the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman was put in my heart. I can't explain it, but it's something that I have felt since. Even through all the slander that has been propagated by the Western media over the last few years. And then, in October 2018, Sheikh Abdul Qadi gave what would become his last public statement which was a discourse in defense of Muhammad bin Salman. And so this episode is my continuation of that message and my commentary on this position to give perspective to the argument in lieu of the time we find ourselves in right now. And so, without further ado, I present to you episode 30, A New Hope, Polybius and the Crown Prince. One of the main things I've learned from this podcast, especially from four episodes in particular, namely episode four on the Sufi resistance in the Maghrib, episode 11 on original Islam, episode 12 on Sultan Abdul Hamid II, and episode four on reviving Islam, is that the enemies of Islam have actively orchestrated the removal of leadership from the deen and turned it into something personal that is reserved for your home and the mosque. Not what Islam has always been in the form of a social structure that breeds justice and healthy expansion. We now stand at a point in time where the global ummah 
has been devoid of central leadership since 1909, and the deposition of the Ottoman Sultan Abdul Hamid II, the last Caliph of Islam. Where we stand now in 2022, we have to understand that that is over a century that the Muslims have been devoid of central leadership. In our time, when we open our eyes and really reflect on everything that's happening around us, it's hard not to see chaos. And with the economic impact of the pandemic on top of an already crippled global economy, next to the shift of global geopolitical power away from the United States and the West towards China and the East, at this point, it is absolutely imperative for us to take stock of where we sit in this rapidly changing world. Now, in order to understand the time we are in and go beneath the surface to see what's really happening around us, I want to begin by unpacking a key point from the work of the ancient Greek historian Polybius. In his study of the political history that came before him, he saw that there are three types of political system, namely monarchy, aristocracy, and democracy. Now, rather than arguing that one form was better than the other, what he showed was that the governance of human society follows a cyclical nature, and that political systems are not set in stone, and that different times require different systems. Now, I want to unpack Polybius' model for us to understand what time we are in now, and what political system of governance is required for our epoch. So Polybius begins his cycle by highlighting that the first system to emerge is monarchy, where, through the natural and spontaneous course of events, the primitive leadership of families grows to clans and tribes and naturally moves through to kingship, where the king provides guidance and protection for those tribes that are under his rule. As monarchy expands, held up by the masses, it increases in wealth and power, until over time and generations, the ruling family degenerates into tyranny. Now, at this point in time, and take note that we are talking generations here, these shifts happen gradually over decades and centuries. But at this point, where the monarch has become a tyrant, the highest ranking families of the kingdom are unable to accept this tyranny. So, They unite to curb the power of the tyrannical monarch, leading to the rise of the rule of an aristocracy. But again, as time passes and erodes the noble behavior of these aristocratic families into decadence and greed, this system degenerates into an oligarchy. Now here, the excesses of the oligarchy drives the people to rebel against the oligarchic families and forces a new kind of rulership in the form of legal responsibility and just administration, democracy. But, and this is the important part, democracy is not the be-all and end-all, because just like the other two political systems, monarchy and aristocracy, over time, democracy too degenerates as the values and moral clarity that led to its creation are forgotten and the system begins to disintegrate into corruption, mob rule, and anarchy. And then, within the ensuing wasteland of this degeneration, man then has to look back once again to strong leadership for protection and guidance, beginning a whole new cycle and the planting of the seeds of monarchy. For us today in the West, raised in the ideals of liberal democracy and its holy text, the constitution of the nation-state, it is rapidly becoming more and more apparent that this system of democracy has degenerated into widespread injustice and poverty. The rich are getting richer and fewer, and the rest of us are all getting screwed. And as we've seen with the pandemic, our natural rights can be thrown straight out of the window at any point, and our only real true freedoms, despite what they tell us, are our freedom to choose our sexual identity and the ability to take on more credit and consume. Yet, we're forced to use a monetary system that has usury as its core principle. 
a monetary system that is the backbone of every single nation state in the world today. A system which is against nature and will always breed greed, distrust and corruption across all stratas of society. And hidden behind the scenes, controlling this monetary system and funneling all the wealth up into their coffers is an unknown oligarchy of banking families, wielding a tyranny that the majority of the global population are not even aware of. So we're living in a time where the tyranny imposed on us is worse than the most brutal tyrants of antiquity by a grouping of oligarchic families that are unknown and hidden, taking no responsibility, all while we're being told that democracy is the greatest political system that has ever been created, while the reality is we're all living in a time of widespread injustice and corruption. If we listen to Polybius, it's quite clear to see that we are rapidly heading towards mob rule and anarchy. But anarchy is abhorrent to Muslims. So it becomes of the utmost importance for us, through both understanding our time and the events playing out around us, that we search through the wasteland of the 21st century for the signs of strong leadership, for guidance and protection to take us through into the next stage of the Polybius cycle, which is back at the beginning, back to strong leadership, kingship and monarchy. Now, I mentioned at the beginning the geopolitical shift of power away from the United States and the West towards China, Russia and the East. It's something that's playing out around us. It's all over the news. We just have to be able to read between the lines. And now sitting, both figuratively and literally, in the middle of this shift of power, we find the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Now it's important to note that this kingdom was founded in 1932 in the wake of the collapse of the Ottoman Empire with the help of Great Britain. Over time, as the country discovered vast oil reserves, the country rapidly developed into one of the richest countries in the world, wielding increasingly more power. But this power was tainted as the rulers of the country fell into the grasps of Anglo-American economic policy, who kept the country in golden handcuffs, making the country extremely wealthy, but both economically and politically subservient to Anglo-American interest. This was made even more apparent after the economic backlash of the complete failure of the Vietnam War. Now, without getting too caught up on the workings of Saudi-US economic relations, it's crucial to understand that since 1974, all Saudi oil exports have had to be settled in US dollars, with sales to the US reinvested in US treasury securities and United States commercial banks. And so, it's difficult not to laugh when you see the irony of the fact that the world's last remaining absolute monarchy, something branded by the West as backwards and barbaric, has actually been the system that has kept the United States Treasury afloat and allowed it to maintain its global financial hegemony. Without Saudi oil, the US Treasury is in serious trouble. With the events happening around us, it's clear to see that the world is changing at a rate that we are struggling to comprehend. And with regards to what we just mentioned, Saudi Arabia stands at the forefront of the future. And at the helm of the ship sits His Royal Highness, the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, Mohammed bin Salman al-Saud. This man is not the only son of his father, King Salman, nor is he the eldest, but based on the promise he has showed from a young age, he has been chosen by his father as the heir to the kingdom. Now, this event must not be taken lightly for a number of reasons. Firstly, King Salman himself is a seasoned and experienced statesman. He's been the governor of Riyadh across the rule of five different kings spanning five decades, and this is a position that requires the maintenance of the delicate balance between tribal clerical and princely interests that define Saudi policy. 
that role is no joke. And with all that experience, from all of his sons, he's seen the most potential in Muhammad. Secondly, having seen that potential, he's been grooming MBS from a young age, through both his education and later appointing him as his personal aide. The importance of this cannot be underestimated. MBS has been taught the ropes directly from his father, a master statesman with a proven track record. And thirdly, King Salman has masterly broken the chain of succession that has favoured the brother over the son since the death of his father in 1953. This is a mighty blow, returning the kingdom away from this crude fantasy of choosing the next brother in line as if they are some godly figure as the son of the founder of the country and moved it back into the natural dynamic of succession. And with that move alone, King Salman has ended one epoch and allowed for the beginning of a new one. So let me reiterate, the crown prince has been personally groomed and trained in statecraft by his father and has the legitimate inheritance. These are the grounds and fundamentals of monarchy. It rests on the fact that a ruler of capacity in office will provide continuity through heredity with the hope that the offspring of a king will be raised and educated to be the most fit to rule and therefore maintaining a healthy society. And so now we turn to the man himself. From the moment his father thrust onto him the responsibility of power, he has been surrounded by enemies from within his family, from within the country and from without. Yet, against all the odds in the face of a global onslaught by Western media and Iran wanting him and his inheritance destroyed, he has survived and continued to renew the country. He's broken from the religious policy of Wahhabism, he's removed the religious police, the terror of the malls, and he has begun the diversification of the country's economy. That said, no ruler can be perfect, least of all someone in the crown prince's position. And it's only therefore natural that he will make mistakes. But, once again, this is a big but, think twice before you believe everything thrown at you by the Western media. I mean, just think about this. How many images are we shown on a daily basis of the refugees arriving from Eastern Europe? Yet, the persecution of Muslims across the world is an afterthought at very best. The enemies of Islam have been plotting against this man and without any proof, they have decided they want everyone to say that MBS is to blame and therefore he has to be punished. Which brings us to our role as Muslims today. At the beginning, I mentioned that the Muslim Ummah has been devoid of central leadership for over a hundred years. At the same time, when we look at the model outlined by Polybius, it's clear to see that the political governance around us has degenerated into its lowest form. And for those of us able to see through the noise, it's quite clear to see that we're heading towards anarchy and chaos. Now, we didn't choose which age we were to be born in, but is of the utmost importance to understand the age in which we find ourselves. And as one system collapses, we have to look to the next system for our protection, which, as we outlined earlier, is strong leadership in the form of monarchy. And when it comes to the Muslims, we have to understand that Muhammad bin Salman has also inherited another title, and that is the guardian of the Haramain. And by extension, that means the guardian of Mecca and the one that makes dua for Mecca, makes dua for the Muslims. And this is a religious leadership that the enemies of Islam didn't realize, and I think it's because Muhammad bin Salman himself didn't realize what had happened. So with the global onslaught against this man, aimed at getting everyone to want to see him punished, what they didn't realize was that Allah had put a protection around him. A hundred years ago, we thought we had lost the deen. 
As time passed, the family who were the enemies of Islam took control of the Haramain and took control of the religion and it looked like everything was lost, sold out for a paltry price. But Allah had decreed to put the power back in the hands of an innocent man. And that man thought his job was just to be the protector of a small group of people. Allah has given us a protector from where we did not expect it. Here is a young Muslim leader, groomed in the art of statecraft, wielding both military and financial power at a time when it is needed most, and on top of all of that, he is the guardian of the Haramain. This man has arrived to us at this point in time by Allah. In bringing this episode to a conclusion, I want to give a little anecdote. In the middle of 2018, I travelled with my family to Milan in Italy. And I remember going for a walk and coming up to the castle in the centre of Milan. And now this castle has huge walls on the outside. And I remember standing there looking up at this magnificent building and thinking, people don't build like this anymore. It dawned on me, of course they don't. It's not commercially viable. And later that year, I had the great honor of going on Umrah. And I remember walking out of the Haram in Mecca, and I was looking up at the magnificent extension that was being built onto the, onto the Haram. And the walls of the building were taller than the wall outside the castle in Milan. And in that moment, I was put in my place. And I thought to myself, I was wrong. Walls like this are still built today. And looking up at the extension work on the Haram, I was filled with awe, because here Muhammad bin Salman has built a palace for the Muslims to worship their Lord in, in the most beloved land on the planet. And so I'd like to end this episode by repeating the dua that Sheikh Abdul Qadir made at the end of his last public announcement. We thank Allah for the gift of Islam and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to pass on the protection of the house of Allah and Medina. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be merciful to us and be generous to us and forgive us for having believed the lies about the crown prince. We ask Allah to give him protection for his life and may Allah give all the Muslims the capacity to defend him and see that the deen of Islam continues its destiny, which is greater than anything that we could understand and expect to happen in one lifetime. And we thank Allah for the barakah of this community, and we thank Allah for the light that has come on this community, and give us the strength to carry out the responsibility, and help this man who took responsibility and took back the heritage which had been taken from him and was given back to him. We ask Allah to be merciful to his father, King Salman. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yisifun, wa salamun ala al-musareen, wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Nuno Moss podcast. In doing the research to put this episode together, there was another theme that emerged from the Polybius cycle, and that is that each of the different epochs that requires its specific form of governance, it also breeds a certain type of man. With the degeneration of democracy as the final phase, also leading to the degeneration of the human into its lowest form. So as one looks forward to the next system of rulership for guidance and protection, one must also nurture and breed a new form of man. And this is something that I hope to explore in greater detail in future episodes. And so once again, thank you. <laughs>